grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Well welcome, my name is James and this is my garden. Behind me I've got some strawberry and raspberry plants growing and we're just starting to see some evidence of fruit and we're looking forward to eating that in coming weeks. Today uh, we gather together um, as the S8 Mission Partnership Churches. Um, I work usually at St Chad's Wood Seats and along with St James Norton, St Paul's Norton Lees and St Peter's Green Hill we make up the S8 Mission Partnership. We're going to gather today to worship God uh, through looking at the Bible, through music and through song and through prayer. At the beginning of the service I'd like us to just still ourselves. We might be sitting inside, we might be sitting outside, we might be uh, lying on our bed in our PJs. Whatever position we are in, let's still ourselves and make ourselves really attentive to God and what he might have for us today. We all need a fresh revelation of his love in our lives today. So let's still ourselves and invite the Holy Spirit to come afresh in our lives today. Come Holy Spirit. As we stay in this sense of stillness, we're going to uh, listen to the words of St. James Norton Choir as they sing a song about Jesus and what he gives us. Let us sit and rest for a while. The tree of life my soul hath seen Laden with fruits and always green The tree of life my soul hath seen Laden with fruits and always green The trees of nature
a few months ago we planted sunflower seeds in these pots in front of you that you see now. It was exciting when finally some shoots came through the soil and now they're growing up slowly but they're certainly growing. Some still haven't quite broken the surface and I wonder if they will. I'm looking forward to seeing how some of these get quite big. I'm wondering how big and tall they get but it's amazing how sunflowers so big some of them get come from such small seeds. Our reading today from the Bible is from Mark chapter 4 from verse 26 onwards. Jesus also said this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again, Jesus said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth, yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his disciples on his own, he explained everything. Toby. A vicar of St Chad's Wood Seeds is now going to talk about this passage. Jeremy Clarkson, he of Top Gear fame, has a new programme starting on Amazon called Clarkson's Farm. And it is, as the title suggests, a story about Jeremy Clarkson running a farm. It's not about tractor racing. It's not about having large combine harvesters, although I gather that he does buy the Lamborghini equivalent of a tractor. But it is about Clarkson running a farm, in fact, running his own farm. Because Jeremy Clarkson has owned a farm since 2008, but up to now has had nothing to do with it. It's been somebody else who's running it, and that person has now retired. Jeremy Clarkson thought that he could have a go, and why not invite the cameras in and make some money out of it at the same time? This is what Jeremy Clarkson said. I genuinely thought you put seeds into the ground, weather happens and food grows. So I thought that's not difficult, but it's phenomenally difficult and the heartache is extraordinary. Plus it's phenomenally badly paid. Well, most of us, I suspect, are aware that farming involves a lot more than weather happening and food growing. It involves irrigation, weeding, fertilising and all manner of hard physical tasks. It makes it a demanding and a precarious way of life and in that respect it's not that much different to it would have been 2,000 years ago in Jesus's time. So from one JC to another, though apart from their initials it's hard to imagine what Jeremy Clarkson and Jesus Christ had in common. Farmers listening to Jesus's parable of the growing seed they will have reacted in the same way as farmers are likely to react to watching Jeremy Clarkson do his stuff. Farmer stays in bed and the harvest just happens. Really? If only it were that simple. You could imagine them saying, stick to the carpentry, Jesus. Let us talk about the farming. But of course, people didn't come to listen to Jesus' stories in order to pick up hints about agriculture. Jesus' parables were not the equivalent of the Judean archers story of everyday farming folk with some useful tips about how to pick up government subsidies. No, people came to hear Jesus talk about the kingdom of God. And so when Jesus talks about sowing seeds, he is of course talking about a divine and not a human harvest. In today's passage from Mark's Gospel, we see two of Jesus' short parables, each beginning with the words, the kingdom of God is like. 
The kingdom of God is like a seed that grows all by itself. The kingdom of God is like a tiny mustard seed. In fact, they're hardly parables at all. They're more of an extended simile. There is no plot to speak of, and in some ways, it could almost be seen as a continuation of the parable of the sower, the longer parable that we will have just heard. In fact, the first of the parables, the growing seed, is unusual because it only appears in Mark's Gospel. Matthew and Luke appear to have thought it so inconsequential they left it out of their Gospels altogether. And some people even think that Matthew and Luke weren't too keen on the parable because on the face of it, it's rather subversive. A parable that you might not want to preach on too often in your churches. After all, if the kingdom of God is like a seed planted in the ground, which will go, grow secretly and inexorably, irrespective of whether the farmer is awake or asleep, then doesn't it suggest that we can leave the kingdom to its own devices? There's no role for us to play. And I confess there are times in my own leadership when I felt like going to sleep and telling God that it's his church and I'm happy to leave all the farming to him. But of course, as anyone who has a garden knows, if you leave a patch of land to its own devices for long enough, it's certainly true that things will grow, but not necessarily the things that you want or in the places that you want them to. Is a lazy carelessness the take-home point that Jesus is giving to his audience? Well, it hardly fits in with any of his other parables, does it? The labourers in the vineyard, the merchant diligently searching for the pearl or the lost treasure. Jesus' lament that the harvest is ready, but the workers are few. All these rather suggest that Jesus takes quite an activist approach to the kingdom of God. He's not asking his disciples to become literally sleeping partners in the enterprise. So let's turn to the other parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a tiny mustard seed that grows really big. That seems pretty straightforward and uncontroversial. Mustard seeds are tiny, as you'll know if you use them in cooking. Fry them and they'll pop out of the pan. And a mustard seed does grow to a fairly sizable plant, somewhere between a large bush and a tree. Not a huge tree, we're not talking about giant redwoods here but big enough to provide shelter for birds. In our own English landscape, we talk about acorns growing into mighty oaks. And the same idea is here. The important thing for Jesus is less the size of the mustard tree and more the tiny nature of the seed. It's obviously a parable about surprising and mysterious magnitude. And the fact that both of these parables are put next to each other and follow shortly on from the parable of the sower should tell us that these are fundamentally parables about seeds. The seeds might be the smallest things in the story, but they are more important than the sleepy farmer or the birds and the branches. Just as in the parable of the sower, the sower is in fact the least important part of the story. But just on the subject of the mustard seed, we don't know for certain that Jesus is talking about a mustard seed. Sometimes it's not easy to um, identify plants or, or creatures um, in biblical um, stories. Paula Gooder, in her new book on the parables, mentions a rather intriguing possibility that the plant in question, which also has a very small seed, was a very fast spreading bush, an invasive plant that if you turned your back, would suddenly be all over your garden. This would be a bit like Japanese knotweed, she suggests. Although perhaps that isn't quite so nice a description of the kingdom of God. Her point is that if that is what Jesus is talking about, then he is describing the kingdom of God as an invasive, intrusive and unruly presence in the world. One that can't be nicely fitted into manicured gardens or capability brown landscapes. I wonder what you think. 
So if the kingdom of God is like a seed that silently grows in the ground and then springs to life, growing in all directions and out of all proportion to its humble beginnings, then what is Jesus saying about the kingdom? And why is he saying it? The first chapters of Mark's gospel have been taken at quite a lick. We've hurried through stories of exorcisms, healings and a daring case of Jesus forgiving sins. We'll shortly move on to even more dramatic stories of Jesus calming the storm and driving a legion of demons into a herd of pigs. Those who are following him can easily start thinking that the beginning of the revolution was here. In fact, in contrast to these parables, the kingdom of God seems to be arriving rapidly and noisily. Jesus has done this in simply a matter of weeks. And what might he do in a year? Today, Galilee, tomorrow, Jerusalem, next year, the world. And yet, at the same time, there would have been some presence, some presence who could see that the Jesus movement was still small and local. There was no power base outside of rural Galilee. And as for challenging Rome, that was hardly going to happen. Jesus might well preach that the kingdom of God is near, but for those looking around at oppression, poverty, disease and death, it didn't really seem that way. Jesus seems to be telling these two parables because he wants to recognise that the kingdom of God is different to human expectations. It's present but not visible. It's tiny, and yet its growth cannot be stopped. It's hidden, and yet it's everywhere. Like the elder bushes that I have to keep hacking down in my garden, you think you've squashed it and it springs back with even more growth than before. In John's Gospel, Jesus will turn the seed metaphor onto himself. The seed is not simply the kingdom of God. It is Jesus himself who dies and is buried as the seed is planted, but does so in order to bring abundant life. The kingdom of God could never have looked smaller or less hidden than on Good Friday. But there is also a sting in the tail in both parables, because both end with a vision of judgment and salvation. When Jesus mentions the ripeness of the grain, along with the sickle and the harvest, he is quoting from the prophet Joel, who looks to that day when God will swing the sickle and trample the grapes in judgment on the nations that oppress Israel. And when Jesus talks about the birds in the branches, he might well be thinking of other Old Testament prophecies of Israel as a spreading tree to which the world will flock. These are not just stories about growth. They have an end point. The growth leads to the harvest, a harvest of judgment for some and salvation for others. Jesus is pointing to the climax of history, a long way perhaps in the future, but certainly nonetheless, just as a seed is certain to sprout and a mustard seed will become a mustard tree, so this judgment and salvation will come. So although there are simple parables about seed and kingdom growth, there are also encouragements to be patient and to keep the end in view. They perhaps have more in common with the parable of the persistent widow who prays and prays without ceasing that justice and judgment will come. For Jesus' listeners seeing the injustice of their lives and society, the message is there for them. The kingdom is present and growing, even if you can't see it, or it looks impossibly small. The harvest is coming. We're in many ways in a better position than Jesus' listeners. Not only do we read these parables in the light of Jesus' death and resurrection, but we also know that against all expectations, the gospel of Jesus really did invade the world, even the most inhospitable parts. For us, the kingdom of God has sprouted, even though we still await the harvest. But in another respect, we find ourselves 
facing a world that seems cold in love, in which atrocities are committed in Western China with impunity. The godless seem to triumph in so many places in the world. The seed of the gospel still seems desperately hidden. So Jesus says to us, be patient, don't fall asleep, but know that ultimately the kingdom of God will come about in God's own time, not forced or rushed by human endeavour, and that a harvest of salvation awaits all those who put their trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that out of the smallest things, your kingdom comes. We pray for the mustard seeds in our lives and in our churches and communities. We will see them grow into something spectacular. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us patience when we fail to see your kingdom around us that we would trust you to bring all things about in their right time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, I'm hoping for continued growth in these sunflower plants, that soon we will see the head and they will grow to some height. That'll be quite exciting and I know my two children will be excited to see that too, as, as will myself and my wife. The theme of growth is something that's picked up by Murray, a vicar of St Paul's Norton Lees in our press. As we come to our prayer, I'm going to uh, use a, a prayer that James wants us to, to in, wanted me to include and I'm going to pray it twice so that we can just pause to think and then you can be praying it more with me the second time. Generous God, you give us gifts and make them grow. Though our faith is small as a mustard seed, make it grow to your glory and the flourishing of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Generous God, you give us gifts and make them grow. Though our faith is small as a mustard seed, make it grow to your glory and the flourishing of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And I'm rather taken with the idea um, that to understand Jesus' teaching on the kingdom, we can see it, and I'm sure it's more than this, but we can see it as a way of seeing. We're part of the kingdom when we see as Jesus sees. So I'm going to use that, see if I can use that as a, as a theme for our prayers. Loving God, help us to see as you see. Help us to see in a kingdom way of seeing. So help us to see that the seed of your spirit, which you have planted in our lives, will grow. Help us to see by faith that it is growing. And though we perhaps don't see much difference in our lives from one day to the next, we can get on with living our lives for you, knowing that you will grow that seed within us. So, Give us grace to nurture the seed of your spirit in prayer and worship, love and service. 
openness and generosity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And help us to pray for a rich harvest of those who wake up to your love in this world. Those who care for others. Those who care for our fragile planet. Those who battle with the ills of societies. In our own country, the rising equalities, the stress from overwork and from poverty, and the lack of priority for family life. And most of all, we pray for those affected by COVID. Bless those who care in the caring professions or those around them. Bless those who facilitate vaccinations. Bless those who work to, to share vaccines more fairly around the world. And bless all who do their bit day by day to battle with the virus. And we pray especially for those we know who are going through difficult times right now. We hold them before God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And loving God, help us to see the way your kingdom works, starting small like a mustard seed, but growing big and effective. As we call to mind now those expressions of your kingdom that we are most familiar with, help us to pray your blessing on these mustard seeds, however little or however much they have grown, praying for our church communities and small groups, for food banks and support groups, caring networks and individuals. for leaders and volunteers, inspirers and carers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And help us to see the opportunities that we have to further the growth of your kingdom. And help us to see what we might not otherwise have seen. Take us in our imagination now to an expression of your kingdom that we might not have been aware of. Might not have just noticed that it was part of a mustard seed that you had planted. Take us in our minds to part of your kingdom now. And as we become aware of it, give us words to bless what you are doing there.
and pray that this part of your kingdom may grow even more effective by your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now we join Jesus in praying for the coming of God's kingdom as we say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're now going to have a song to help us reflect further and to worship God together. Feel free to just sit and let the words wash over you, or if you prefer, stand and, and sing. The words will be on the screen.
thank you, Jesus, for your presence with us and that you are faithful. And we give you thanks, Jesus, for your kingdom and celebrate its hiddenness but presence in our midst. And we want to see your kingdom grow and see signs of your kingdom. So we sing this next song together as a prayer. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us we pray. are coming to the end of our time together today and perhaps some of the things that have been talked about or prayed about or said today are new to you or have caused you to perhaps ponder things and want to ask questions please do contact us using the links below this video if you would like to explore any of these things further or perhaps speak to a friend who you think might be able to help also over the coming weeks I should point out that as we progress through the summer um, the services that we put out as a mission partnership online will change a little bit. Um, they will still hopefully help you to engage with worship online, but I just wanted to give you 
a heads up about that. So a short blessing for today as we approach the end of our service. May the Lord bless you and keep you and grant you his peace today and tomorrow and always. Amen. We end this service today with a song that gives thanks for the world that we inhabit, the world that God created, the world that we are given. And it reminds me of the themes of kingdom growth from our Bible reading today. <laughs>